see you all here today, and you look very well contented and everything. We hope we'll give you a nice day. This morning we have a subject that I think is of more or less vital importance in these times. But we have to begin by going back to one of the earliest concepts that we have in the world of science, and that is the transmutation of metals. We do not know where alchemy, as we call it today, originated. But the present word is derived from two compar comparatively recent terms, the word chemistry and the ancient uh, Hebrew and Greek and Egyptian syllable El. Alchemy. El is a name of deity. Elohim and uh, many others. Therefore, the term alchemy means divine chemistry. It means something entirely different from the concept or idea of a materialistic transmutation of metals. But very early in China, even in India, later in Japan, in many parts of the European continent, chemists arose laboring with the concept of the transmutation of actual physical substances. Today, science does this every day, and from the beginning of time, nature did it every moment. Actually, to deny that it is possible to transmute or transform a substance is not scientifically sound. Every moment, transmutation is going on around us and within us. The whole system of digestion, the nutritional problem faced by every living creature is a fine example of basic alchemy, a divine process of transforming substances until they serve the various utilities which are necessary for survival. Paracelsus von Hohenheim was a physician for the family of the Fugas in Germany. They were the great mining family with mines all over Europe. He was the doctor in charge of the possible accidents and sicknesses that afflicted the workmen. While there, he experimented and wrote considerably on the subject of alchemy. He pointed out, for example, that in the area where the various metals were mined by the Fugas, uh, grape orchards and vineyards stood on the outer surface, on the surface of the earth, beneath which these mines were located. Those mines which were involved with gold uh, had a peculiar circumstance involved in them. If you took the grapevines that grew on the surface and burned them, you would find gold. In other words, the roots of the plants were picking it out of the earth also. Years ago, we had a character here in Los Angeles who has gone to his blessed reward, who was an alchemist. And naturally enough, for an alchemist who had to make a living, he was in a head of cheese factory. Which, by the way, if you study it carefully enough, is part of our story. But no one thinks that far. But this alchemist one day showed me a little glass retort about an inch and a half tall. Now, oh, about less than the size of a pullet egg. But in this was a little rock, and on the rock was a tiny layer of gold. It looked under a strong glass like a little flower, but it was actually, actually grow, gold growing in an hermetically sealed vessel. Uh, I tried to get the right to keep this as a pre uh, preservation or as a proof of something, but I was never able to get it away from it. But anyway, he insisted, <laughs> he insisted that this little gold tree or little gold thread like vine, a leaf, a fern leaf like thing, had actually grown in this bottle from these rock upon which it was still attached that actually gold, gold grows. Von Hohenheim uh, also stated this, that uh, areas where mining had exhausted all known gold supplies, a hundred years later, gold was found again. In some way, gold continued to reproduce itself from a kind of seed. So gold gradually came to be a symbol, and it was as a symbol 
that it was of most interest to the mystical alchemists of the 16th and 17th centuries. To them, gold was simply a symbol of the human soul and the divine soul. Gold to them was a spiritual agent. It was a symbol of what man is as a mortal creature and how this mortal creature can be transformed into a divine enlightened power. Gold in alchemy in the 17th and 18th century was a synonym for soul. It was that part of man's nature which combined the elements which we find today symbolically in the symbol of mercury. The ancient system or triad for the production of gold was salt, sulfur, and mercury. Salt being a symbol of body, sulfur being a symbol of spirit, and mercury being a symbol of the binder or the uniting substance, that which was capable of transmuting one into another. Therefore, the human being, in a sense, is spirit, soul, and body. The spirit as, uh, belonging to eternity, the body belonging to the earth and matter, and mercury a mysterious symbol to a combination or union of heaven and earth in the transmutation of life from a divided substance to a united essence. Uh, this type of thinking was the problem of almost all of ancient philosophy. Paracelsus and others warned the alchemists not to center their attention upon the transmutation of metals. But, as von Welling tells us in one of his alchemical writings, that which is true on a spiritual level must also be true on all other levels. And if it is possible to transform mortality to immortality in man, it is also possible in nature, it is possible in all the kingdoms of life, and it is possible of all the sub substances which make up the created universe. So uh, Paracelsus did not deny uh, the transmutation of metals, but warned that the acceptance of this as the primary factor in alchemy was a mistake, and that as a result of this mistake, most alchemists failed because they failed first of all to set up the transmutation within themselves by means of which the true understanding of the mystery could be developed within their own consciousness. In other words, as another alchemist said, there are seeds of life in everything. Uh, in India and in China and Japan, these are called the Buddha seeds. They are the seeds of all essences and substances. All things grow from their own seed, root, or cause. And the cause of immortality is in every created mortal creature. The seed of immortality is in man. The seed of all knowledge is within the human being. The seed of all hope and of all life and of all wisdom and all understanding, all these are locked within the individual and they must grow as plants grow. They must gradually overcome the resistance of ignorance. They must day by day and year by year spread their life in all ways. The tree of wisdom grows from the human mind. The tree of, the, of love comes from the human heart. The tree of God comes from the eternal seed within the consciousness of the human being. So all of alchemy was primarily a release or a revelation, a transmutation of ignorance into wisdom, a transmutation of death into life everlasting, a transmutation of ignorance into wisdom. And all this was done by a very elaborate process. The secrets of transmutation are beautifully and symbolically set forth in a number of works. Many uh, chemists were deceived by the terms, however, and felt that the formulas were purely physical, but they were not. They were, they were all keys to the release of the infinite life locked within existence itself. Uh, transmutation was transformation, regeneration, resurrection, restoration, 
reformation. All these things are releases of the seed of eternity within time, the seed of life everlasting in the symbolic substance of illusional disintegration. So we take this point to move a little bit to study the subject which is of great concern to us at the present moment, the regeneration of human society. Now, there are many attitudes on this particular subject. Many feel, for instance, today in the general disillusionment that the hoped for restoration is far removed. Others doubt its reality. Just as scientists have doubted that gold could be made from base metals, so uh, politicians and diplomats doubt seriously that peace can be brought out of the confusion in human consciousness. Everywhere, dissolution, division, and mortality uh, rules human relationships. This, however, is contrary to universal law. There is within humanity as a collective also the seed of its own regeneration. Everything grows from seed. Someone must plant the seed of peace or there will never be seeds of peace in the, in the world. In the book of Revelation, there is a tree that bears twelve manner of fruit, which is for the healing of the nations. This tree represents a, a truth, a reality, a great revelation, growing from a seed in human consciousness. Now, human beings today all have within them the seed of their own perfection. The perfection is not something added. It is something released. It is not bestowed. It is revealed through the internal structure of human consciousness. If we go back, for instance, to the period of Plato and Aristotle, we realize that when Plato died, there probably were not 20 copies of his dialogues in existence, and they were all handwritten by his disciples for their own use. So far as world knowledge, world recognition, of Plato's contribution in his own day there was none. Whatever he attempted to do, he did, and when he finally passed out of this life, he left no institution behind him. He left nothing that endured. He left not even a solid codex of his own writings. And yet today he is better read, better known, and better appreciated than ever before. Because somewhere within the nature of his own labor there was the seed of restoration. That which was truth in his writings can never die. The same is true of the words of Christ. Those words were not printed in his own lifetime. Only a few ever saw them or heard them or saw him. But that which is eternal, inevitable, cannot die. And the true tree of life in us cannot die. Today we have many confusions in the world. We have a series of labors that have gone sour. We have attempted to do great things, but they were not the things that were necessary. And in the effort to be great, we have failed to fulfill the natural simplicity of ourselves. We have accepted the idea uh, that fame and fortune are the answers to the human problem. But until fame and fortune are regenerated, until the true seeds within both fame and fortune are restored to their original scientific and spiritual dignities, we will never get anywhere with them. Every mistake, every sorrow, every problem that we have has within it the seed of its own solution. And also it is contributing to the ultimate perfection of ourselves our world, and our universe. To find these things, we have to begin to search for the keys to regeneration, the keys to restoration. Now, it how so happens that these keys have not been entrusted to the sky or the earth. They've been entrusted to man himself. Because of those creatures existing on earth today, the human being is the most evolved, having the greatest potentials, having the greatest equipment with which to accomplish major good in this world. The human being has the facilities 
the mental abilities, the rational faculties by which he can take the seed of eternity within himself and release it as described in the structure of Kabbalistic philosophy. So we have here today a world of people, nearly five billion, perhaps a little more, each one of which, whether it knows it or not, is immortal. Each one of these creatures has been endowed with a potential. In each human being, the seed of eternity has been sown in the fields of time. The human being could not breathe, could not walk, could not think, could not exist if eternity was not within him. The eternal life, the life of all things, is that which gives man life. Each kingdom of nature unfolds this life according to its own rules and laws. Each kingdom of nature tries to expand its potentials. We see the gradual development of the plant kingdom, in which a small lichen somewhere gradually develops into a magnificent tree. We see all the flowers of the field. We also see all the beautiful crystals in the rocks. Everywhere, something of a divine nature is being revealed through kingdoms of nature. In the animal kingdom, other values are revealed. We discover perceptions and reflective powers uh, that we do not even take for existing, let alone take for granted. Then we finally come to the individual, the human being, who is the sum of all this evolutionary process. Here we have a being of which, for instance, we can mention such be be beings as Leonardo da Vinci. We can think in terms of Michelangelo. We can think of terms of Stradivarius or any of the great leaders of human arts, crafts, and revelations. We can think of the saints and the sages, all of the different degrees of development and unfoldment that already are obvious in the human being. They are obvious because he is endowed with them. They are obvious because they are manifestations of the thing that makes him exist, and that is the divine seed of life within himself. That which is within himself is his own immortality. It is also the, in that part of him which functions in his daily life. It is that power within him which digests his food, keeps his heart beating, controls and regulates di digestion and elimination. It is this same power that gives him the right to write a book, to make a great contribution in art or music or science or philosophy. Ah, all the different departments of life arise from one tiny seed, the divine seed in man. It is this one divinity which is the unit. This is, this is the monad of existence. This is the one from which all things come. And yet all things in their infinite divisions are still one. From one source all knowledge arises. For one purpose all knowledge exists, and that is the perfection and growth of living things. In our course of life, politically and socially, we have forgotten almost entirely the part of ourselves which alone can be solutional. We cannot solve with the mind unless the mind is inspired. We cannot create with the hand unless the hand is regulated and guided. We cannot create with the body unless the body itself responds to a divine eternity within itself. So here we are, human beings, uh, each with a different kind of destiny, each dedicated to some purpose, each one hoping, fearing, believing, each one living and dying, within a peculiar situation in which the real reason for the whole thing remains unknown. We do not today believe or realize the power of this seed germ within ourselves, which seed germ is eternity hidden within the folds and regions of time. This inside thing is that which has to be released. And the release of this is the great secret of transmutations and transformations. Everything depends for its survival upon this submerged, hidden source of life within ourselves. It is the spark of eternity in us upon which we depend for everything. 
And when that leaves the body at death, it takes with it every activity, every process, except disintegration. This is one of the reasons why uh, it seems as though in this world there's been a great overlooking of something. We have been trusting each other on a level which is not trustworthy. We have tried to work out our problems without bringing into focus the one solution that is possible, and that is the release of the eternal plan through ourselves. It is the same with nations. From the beginning, nations have been compound individuals. They have existed with temperaments and dispositions. They each have their own peculiar specializations in life. They have their languages, their customs, their arts, and many times their religions and their languages. All these are parts of a unit, and the uh, unit of a nation is a kind of collective atom. For each atom is, this, is a personification of a racial, a cultural, or a social problem or pressure. So in the atom problem, we have... Uh, the Adam who is Greek, the Adam who is Chinese. But we also recognize that each of these compounds is ensouled. Each one of them exists as itself rather than falling into chaos because the entire structure is embodying, embodying a principle. The development of humanity, the tree of races, means that a life principle is flowing through all races. And these races become branches upon a great tree. And this tree is the tree of life itself. But every nation is part of that plan. Every individual within a nation is a leaf or a twig or a bud upon a tree. A living thing depending upon one life. Now this means that be, whether we realize it or not, there is only one life. And this is the thing which is difficult for us under to understand. In our way of competition, in our way of self-centeredness, each individual competes with another and uh, tries to outdo others. In strangeness, of it is, may seem, there is no one to compete with because actually there is only one life. And all competition is a mistaken belief that this life can be controlled in one direction or another, when in the truth of the matter, the creatures must be controlled by that life principle. The principle is not divided. There is no such a thing in the principles of things as the various structures we set up and defend so stoutly. We defend our politics without realizing that all government rises from a tree and that the root of this tree is in eternity. We believe all arts and sciences uh, have their sources in the various geniuses which created them and which we regard as their patrons. Actually, however, painting, music, literature, architecture, all these are trees growing from one root. Life in all of its manifestations is one life diversified through expression and through creation, but never actually divided. If one of these arts should actually die, all would die with it, because it is part of one life. Now these various plants and things becoming like individuals, nations develop characteristics. They develop likes and dislikes. They are influenced by longitude and latitude and today they are influenced largely by lassitude. They are last, uh, influenced by fable, by myth, uh, by tradition, by heredity. All these things seem to divide these nations from each other. But uh, as we find so clearly pointed out in the, in the uh, uh, Shakespearean plays, some of them, especially The Merchant of Venice, Every one of these various factors depends upon a common feeling, a, a common reality. If a child dies, does not its parent weep, regardless of race? If someone is killed in an accident, is there not a tragedy, whether we know that person or not? 
If a nation destroys itself or tries to, is this not a catastrophe, regardless of what nation it is? Is it more beneficial to life for a small country to die than for a great one? All are one. There is only one nation, and that is the humanity itself. There is only one art, the art of living. There is only one science, the science of salvation. There is only one religion, eternal hope of good. So if we can begin to get this oneness out of it, where we can see it, we can do a great deal with it. And yet to the average person, this oneness is more or less obviously necessary, but no one pays much attention to it. We think of each person coming into the world as an individual, free to do what they want to do and that the life within them is bestowed in order that they may be able to do what they please. So the divine within us is used to advance the human and material ambitions that we develop. Each person seems to feel that he can build a different bit structure upon the one life which made him alive. He seems to believe or think that he can create a destiny for himself using this one divine power as eternal life, but that divinity is merely a fuel which permits him to do as he pleases. Then in spite of everything to the contrary, the individual is not responsible to anything for the use he makes of everything. This is a, a factor which we have never been able to completely overcome. But we're getting more and more into the situation where if we can't understand it, we're going to be in a very bad way. We are still hoping that in some way, in some manner of our own conjecturing, that we're going to be able to arbitrate these differences, that each individual will be able to continue to do as he pleases, but in some way the power to please in a destructive manner will be reduced. I think the answer to this is something for science to give a lot of thought to, because the first thing we need to know now is the thing that science can't tell us, and that is what is life? What is the eternal energy that sustains things? What is the mysterious seed from which all life comes? In what ground is mortality planted? In what part or field of space does evolution move? Actually, we have to look very carefully to see what is life. Is life motion? Not necessarily. Is life ambition, hope? Is it tragedy or comedy? Is it contained within any structure that we have developed? The only sensible way that we can really approach this is the way we have never used and that is to recognize that in substance all of these things are the same. They are all specializations within an indivisible reality. While we try to make separation real, while we are in a competitive relation with life, we cannot transmute our own activities and restore the unity which is necessary for survival. We have to gradually recognize this problem of alchemical transformation. But before we can really accept it, we have to have some psychological proof, some form of evidence to give us confidence that this is true. It is not enough just simply to say it. We must in some way become aware, completely aware, of this inevitable reality. So aware and so conscious of it that we are enabled to develop its resources within ourselves and share them with others. The alchemists and their working in their little laboratories were all looking for something. We find uh, many accounts of them, and in several great European cities there are the old buildings called the Houses of the Alchemists, famous even now because at some time a, mag a mystical chemist lived there and labeled to perfect his works. Now, if this alchemy of the problem is real, how are we going to find out about it? How can we ch transform this searching 
into a discovery. Well, in the old alchemical system, uh, there was a mysterious being called Elias the Artist. Elias is the patriarch referred in the Bible as one who went to God without death. And this mysterious power, Elias the Artist, would come in the night to some alchemist who was considered worthy and would give him the secret or forgive him perhaps a few grains of the elixir of life or the transmutation would stay a little time and then disappear and never be seen again and in each case the Elias power left some proof behind it it left evidence to the chemist himself that there was an answer that there was a solution and in some cases as in the case of Sandavogius uh, this powder uh, actually was used by him to transmute base metals and apparently physically he believed at least it accomplished this end or was it true that Sandavogius also knew and put into symbolism what this powder really was that it was not there to transmute base copper or bronze or iron but to transmute base ignorance superstition or fear into the realization of truth I think we have to recognize that the great transmutation must be in some way justified by human experience itself we should be justified by the mere fact that we are alive because the very existence in which we live has never been explained adequately we do not know where we actually came from long before there were stars we do not know where we are going long after the last star goes out we do not know what we are made of except of substances that are held together by a strange magnetic chemistry we know that we live from day to day upon life we know that the very process of digesting food is an alchemical process but we also must realize that this process goes to the acceptance and digesting of experience which is another kind of food a kind of food that nourishes the mind and understanding that we must also experience the mystery of love of divine acceptances of things these are foods which must also sustain hope within the individual therefore those things necessary for the attainment of the alchemical transmutation must be experienced within the person he must become aware of these truths and he must be able to apply them socially upon the different levels and parts of his society he must understand what governments are the governments are nothing but the hollow shadow or extension of a divine way of doing things and that as long as any government differs from the archetype from which it came it cannot fulfill itself therefore governments must be regenerated they must be reformed revised and restored to their original purpose namely the purpose of fulfilling the infinite unfoldment of the divine purpose in creation while governments are dependent entirely upon books and codes and creeds or laws are passed only by those who are themselves ignorant of what law is or where it comes from or why it is or what it must be we are in trouble when long as we are willing to build our laws solely upon previous laws or upon the pre- uh, previous incumbent in public office we will never get to understand the final great fact namely that all things obey except man and out of his disobedience fell the angels every part of nature except man is incapable by its own constitution of actually violating universal law it has no initiative it has no free power to become a separate creature man is separate he is separate because potentially he is capable of a greater advancement than any other kingdom of nature on this earth he is the leading power here all previous embodiments on this planet have been leading toward him they have been gradually releasing that part of his own potential 
which enables him to stand and proclaim his existence. This, however, is not to be the subject of great rejoicing, nor is he to become completely overwhelmed by his own egotism. The fact that he exists is a remarkable thing. The, existing, the fact that he can exist well is a still more remarkable thing. And he hasn't quite gotten there yet. But he is hoping. But his hopes have to be brought into some form of pattern. And when the old time, we uh, in the Bible, they spoke, spoke of the earth as a garden and considered that man was the gardener. Well, a gardener is one who takes care of the plants. Uh, we're not really doing that. As gardeners in the garden of life, we are not protecting it. We are exploiting it. We are not doing all we can to preserve it. We are doing all we can to make it a servant of personal ambitions. So we may say that nearly all of that, all, all of that which is rooted in ambition has a tendency to be corrupt. It may not necessarily be wrong, but it can easily become so. We cannot, by ambition of our own, do that which only eternity knows. We cannot solve problems that are greater than our insights or our understandings. But fortunately, we don't have to. We only have to come into a harmonious relationship with the great plan of life itself. And this is what, in a large way, alchemy really represented. It t told us through human digestion and the digestion of metals that there are processes going on that if we do not interfere with them, corrupt them, or pervert them, are magnificently sufficient. The only thing we can do is cut ourselves off from life by the misuse of it. We can only destroy that which we have labored so hard to build, bodies, attitudes, institutions, nations, governments, parties, and uh, policies. All these things we have built up only to destroy them by our own selfishness. Now we say that's a very great, a great tragedy. Yes, but unfortunately there's a still another point that is more important. Namely, if we can destroy them, they are not the thing we are seeking. Anything that can be destroyed is not part of the reality which is completely indestructible. Therefore, we have to gradually bring our own consciousness into relationships with things in which we become aware of the indestructibility of truth. Until we realize this, we will continue to destroy idols we have set up, falsehoods we have deified, until finally we turn against them. Now, in the closing years of the present century, uh, many of the ancient esoteric arts have come back into focus. Uh, Fifty years ago, an astrologer was considered to be mildly mad. Today, he is becoming more and more interesting, and not only to humanity, but to the sciences. And there are a great many liberal thinkers who, are in the last generation, would never permit themselves to study such matters. We came along with acupuncture, which for two or three thousand years was used in China and scoffed by us. And all of a sudden, we're interested in it. We're interested in the Yi Ching. We're interested in yoga and Vedanta. We're interested in esotericism, psychism. Every type of thing that was once important then passed into submergence and now begins to come out again. Why? Because we are becoming more and more, uh, we say, might say, fearful. We are more and more aware that there has to be something we don't know. That there's some way of doing some of these things better than we're doing them. So we're beginning to look for the people who did them better. And we suddenly realize that they are the ones we've been making fun of for centuries. Because we believe so firmly in our own mistakes. Now the uh, coming way of, of thinking has brought back a tremendous revival in alchemy. Alchemy is flourishing with new books, new publications, new exponents, new researches, new projects every day. But there's this one thing we have to be aware of. 
and that is, as uh, Basil Valentine pointed out, the great chemist, woe unto the gold makers. If we are going to use alchemy now to pay the national debt, we'll be exactly where we were to start with. <laughs> If we firmly believe that we can use these superior sciences to protect our mistakes, we're wrong. We are only able to use these correctly if we are also dedicated persons. Unless the, uh, the happy-go-lucky attitude, which is neither happy nor lucky, that we are in now, is changed, there is no form of learning that we can restore or create that will not land in the same condition we are in today. Because it is a value pattern, we have to change the basic relationship between ourselves and life. This is the great transmutation. This is the secret of the philosopher's stone and the elixir of life. We cannot simply use these powers to take care of our present mistakes, we cannot use psychism to find out how to get out of being alcoholics and then keep on drinking. We cannot say that we are going to use philosophy and then keep on nagging our neighbors and insulting each other. We cannot have enemies and be truth seekers at the same time. We cannot go on supporting the policies with our minds while we are attacking them with our souls. So out of it all comes the necessity of starting with the basic element of alchemy, and that is the person. Bamey and the Rosicrucian group in Europe, many other systems, have emphasized the point that regeneration begins with the individual that only a person who has a proper internal relationship with life is willing to or capable of making the changes that are necessary. So somewhere in this process, we must identify the pearl of great price, the seed soul in ourselves, something that is so mysterious, so minute, that it is like the proverbial mustard seed that being the least among the seeds shall grow into a great tree. The search for the seed of life. And science should be seeking it. Everything should be seeking to, to know that which is locked within something so small and so abstract that we cannot even distinguish it or analyze it, and yet from which flows all existence, all condition, all progress, and all reality. Here is the tiny germ, which is the greatest thing in the world, far greater than anything we know. And it's in us, and one thing, we can prove that. We can prove it by the fact that we're here this morning. We can prove it the fact that we can raise a hand, that we can drive a car, uh, that we can uh, enjoy a bad program on TV. <laughs> All these things are truths of something. The fact that we like one thing and dislike another, believe one thing and disbelieve another, these are all evidences of the presence within ourselves of a power, of a life reality, a germ of eternity by which we exist. We are not the only ones. That germ is in everything. But in man it is a certain core it is re reaching further into the great world of needs. In other words, it is the basis of the fruit of life that we are all seeking. Here we are, able to think, able to play the piano magnificently, able to control and direct the um, actual forces that make up our civilization. All of these things are within our dispatch and within our uh, area of possibility. We have already produced a great world, the modern world, but we have not ensouled it. The thing we have produced up to the present time is a robot. Our whole civilization is a robot because it is simply an instrument for the fulfillment of our own ignorance. 
in the sense not of dispelling that ignorance, but making it possible to live with it. We are trying to live with our own imperfections happily and permanently, and this cannot be. The only way we can get over our disasters is to get over the weaknesses and fallacies in our own minds and hearts. So the first thing the alchemist has to do is transmute himself. He has to make sure that he deserves greater power than he has. He must make sure that if, if he is appointed to public office, he will be incorruptible and will also be elected to govern them. Leadership, as Poito pointed out, must be rested in those who know. And those who know, know one thing primarily, that the entire universe is subject to immutable laws. Keep the rules and live, break the rules and die. It is as simple as that, except you can't really die. Death, in this case, means the destruction of the illusion. And if all you have inside of yourself is an illusion, then it may appear to be a hopeless end. But actually that thing inside, that mysterious seed, the soul seed, does not die. It cannot. It can be delayed. It can fall upon bad ground. And it can be, for some reason or other, taken away by the birds of the air. But that the seed itself cannot cease. So somewhere we've got to make peace with reality. If we don't make peace with it, we're not going to get the results that are necessary. But how are we going to make peace with it, whereas in the moment our entire life and thought is based upon transitory, impermanent, and inconsequential attitudes? How is the average individual uh, to become capable of ruling himself, let alone ruling anyone else. Well, it should be part of education, but it isn't. It should be part of everything that we do, but it is not. We are constantly being schooled to do things to perpetuate our mistakes. We have a standing army to perpetuate our hatreds. We have everything we can think of to perpetuate a kind of egotism, self-centeredness, or hopeless and ruthless ambition. We are not trying, really, to make any basic correction. We are competitively trying to prevent someone to, from doing to us what we have been long waiting to do to them. All this, we cannot solve anything. So comes a sacred art, an art maybe that was founded in the ancient temples of Egypt perhaps earlier an art which is re recorded in the ancient Hermetic writings, the, the books of Hermes Trismegistus, found in the scriptural writings of all peoples, this mysterious secret art, secret science of personal redemption, personal renovation of character and of life. And uh, it means that certain changes have to come about. Now, in the Orient, there was a very elaborate system of esoteric discipline set up to help the individual uh, to cure these deficiencies in himself, to build up a personal integrated being, a personality, a character, a temperament, a disposition, a unit within himself by means of which he can gradually come into the realization of the soul potential locked within him. This uh, type of discipline and so forth, however, has run into bad times here in the West for the reason that it is being cultivated, at least in some cases, simply as a means of advancing the same ignorance as it is supposed to overthrow. It is not being done because the individual wants to understand truth. It is because he wants to be wiser than someone else and benefit by it. So wherever these um, exercises are given to help the individual to be greater than his neighbor, danger lurks. If these exercises are to release him from those things which he has never corrected in himself, it's bad. If, however, it is a simple desire to find truth, not for self, 
but for the common good, then there is legitimate progress to be made. But all this progress begins with very simple things. We have these powers. We have within ourselves this seed of eternity, this tremendous dynamo, this enormous, incredible current of life. And just as a house is lighted by electricity from one great station, so our own individual magnetic fields, our electric selves, are all fed by the energy from one eternal plant. And that eternal plant is the divine life. But that energy is living energy, conscious energy, wise energy, loving energy, and not simply blind force. So in order to ma manage and work over these problems, the individual must begin his own alchemical uh, researches. Of course, as in the older days, he will be ridiculed. And in many cases, the alchemist was persecuted. Some of them were actually died for their beliefs. There were martyrs in all fields of human regeneration. But still, regardless of all these things, uh, we have to go on to try and find a way to reaffirm our own total unity, the unity of all that lives, that we are of what Buddha called a vast commonwealth, that we are a kind of cosmic commune, in which all existing things are citizens of one life principle, one life world. Visibly, we can't see it as so small. If we had the eyes of Bemi or Emanuel Swedenborg, we would see it because it extends beyond all conception. It is more vast than the vision of Dante. It is a tremendous situation in which could we see this cause. It would no longer be a tiny little thing that we can't find. It would burst into something that covers the universe from end to end with eternal effulgency, filled everywhere with life and meaning and reality. Now man, as uh, St. Thomas Aquinas has, been, uh, has taught, is equipped to handle this. It is possible for the human being to become aware of the totality of the life of which he is a part. He must grow up to this, but until he grows up to it, he must continue to pass through the tragedies of ignorance. We are all going to make it, there's no question about that, but we can make it easier if we know what we're doing. And we can make it easier if we say to ourselves, for instance, that in our own inner life, there is a stream of life. There is a mysterious river that flows out of paradise. There is this mysterious source of life, this energy, that we're going to use every day. We're going to use it to learn to walk. We're going to use it to learn to speak. We're going to learn it and use it to build a house. We're going to use it for all kinds of labors. This one great energy and we are releasing it little by little. Because if we released it all at once, it would destroy us. It would be far too great for this body to maintain the challenge of a wisdom far more perfect than itself. So we only gain a little insight at a time. But we can, by a little effort of our own, become aware that we have a responsibility to the fact that we are alive. Nothing is here for no reason. Everything has purpose. Each individual, when he reaches maturity, has become a custodian of life. He has become part of a great living mechanism. He has become part of a tremendous flow of energy. Energy which he cannot master, but which he can learn to use. As he uses it, he no longer abuses it. And when he gets to the point where he can transmute his own mistakes, where he can begin to see the things he did not do well and try to do them better, when he comes to this condition, he is already well on the way toward an enlightenment. Now, what are the immediate fruits of this enlightenment in terms of alchemy? 
those who possess this uh, power, this mysterious elixir of life, who are masters of the golden stone, these individuals still live here just like everyone else. They are forbidden by the rules of their orders to even reveal that they are different. They live in this world but not of it. They have a tremendous life inside themselves and are not dependent upon the encouragement of their neighbors for survival. They cannot be captured within the framework of a bad law. On the other hand, their wisdom and insight shows them how they can live surrounded by laws that are not good and still be right themselves. Actually, the alchemist is no longer just a citizen of the country in which he is born. This point was well made by the Greeks and by uh, many of the ancient peoples. Namely, that it is a mistake to assume that there are only certain realms in which the human being can function. There are not only the gods above of the Greeks and mortality below. There are something in between. The, this in-between thing uh, has been in theology made into the hierarchies of the angels and archangels and so forth. But in the classical times, there was a state between uh, mortality and divinity. And this was the state of the heroes. The heroic state. Or oh, as Rose, one Rosicrucian said, there is a race that exists on a plane above us made up only of those who have been born into it through their own wisdom. And they are called the servants of the generalissimo of the world. So this uh, race, so to say, this superior order, this heroic order, is composed of those who in this world have achieved freedom from negation and have dedicated themselves with those who have gone before to the, to the ultimate service of all that lives. These heroic powers, which we develop through our own integrities, become the basis of a release from the mistakes that have been made. Once we have this correct inside knife, we know why things happen to us. We are no longer moved by the things that we call joy and sorrow. We live in a state of truth in which all things have their own right and natural existence. We are not subject to any of the calamities that befall ignorance, because we are no longer ignorant. And no matter what is done with civilization, no matter how many laws men pass to improve each other's condition, suffering, sorrow, and death will endure as long as the causes of them have not been corrected within the plan of things. So in alchemy, as we see it, <coughs> we can face into a great many interesting and remarkable facts. We can say uh, something that primitive people, for some unknown reason, have long sensed. Uh, sophistication has been a blinding factor. When we began to overestimate ourselves, we underestimated everything else. And when we began to think of our own magnificence, we forgot that we are tiny pebbles along the shore of a vast ocean so that uh, we have to gradually get back to a certain simplicity. Nearly all primitive peoples have encountered one level of, rela of relationship with life that is important. One of the, they don't understand everything. Perhaps they are merely shamanistic peoples. Uh, but they do, most primitive people, have a realization of the tremendous integrities of some power, something greater than themselves. On various levels, they interpret this power. To some, it's ancestor. To others, it's totem. To some others, it's the beloved dead. To still others, it is monodos, or great ones who walk among the mountains. But in every case, these people have a natural esotericism. They have natural mystical qualities which they have not outgrown by sophistication. Now it's true that these faculties are genuine in many instances 
And it is also true that they have gradually dropped out of sight. Well, the answer to that is also understandable. The reason why primitive psychism has gradually faded away is because it again became a blind alley. Primitive psychism kept the individual from actually realizing the realities. It was a kind of protection. It was as though parents were taking care of children and the child turned to the parent for for everything or turned to the teacher for everything. But after a while, the child grows up to the point where it must make its own decisions. It must no longer lean or depend. It can no longer depend for its survival upon some benevolent power beyond its understanding. It must actually learn to stand, to, to live, to become a being, and transmute, transmute negative natural relationships into positive natural cooperations. It is not enough that we should believe in a summer land beyond the grave. It is that we should have the intelligence and the intellect to use all of our extrasensory perceptions as nature intended, service, to use them entirely uh, to help to discover this divine reality, which is the end and goal of our search while we remain in the human stage of development. So we have to keep on working with this problem. Dear, we have a lunch and we eat something. And this something mysteriously gets tr absorbed, transformed. Uh, we don't tell the stomach what to do. Sometimes we put it in a position where it can't do anything. <laughs> Under such conditions, it becomes a little resentful. <laughs> then we bring out the bicarbonate of soda. But all the processes of the body, from the beating of the heart to the nutrition of cells, Everything that happens within this uh, a circumference of our skin is incredible. It is a miracle upon miracles every moment. There seems to be no way in which we can explain the wisdom of body cells that we can actually re realize the conscious cooperation of tissues. We cannot understand these things. Because in some mysterious way, our mind has sort of outgrown being a small cell. And we are now interested in trying to be a greater cell somewhere else. But actually, the miracle of existence is present to us every moment. It is present to us in the birth of every child that comes into the world. It is in us in every proof of the continual principle of life that is transferred from one generation to another how we do not know we can see only certain physical symptoms symbols procedures but the great transmission of life is beyond human understanding therefore we are, have a little world a little island of thoughtfulness in a great ocean of the unknown we are constantly seeking to know more but because of the peculiar dulling of our instruments, we have gradually turned away from the search for the unknowable to the gradual refinement of things that we do immediately see some value uh, coming from. But actually, this one thing that we don't see is the only thing that is important. It is the basis of law. Within it is the absolute way in which everything has to be done. Within it is the proof of human growth. Within it is the release by which the individual gradually, step by step, actually grows up into a divine nature. And sometime in the infinite of things may be a God in his own right. But all these things are based upon a, an energy, what the alchemists called the spirit or souls of the metals. The souls of the metals can be brought together. And here is a very interesting point. Uh, Von Welling, in his uh, Opus Cabalisticum, points out that no metal can be combined with another metal in its present state. One gross metal cannot be amalgam to another gross metal in terms of alchemy. Before an element can become mingled with another element, 
It must be sublimated itself and its own individuality overcome. It must cease to have separateness before it can be united with anything else. Therefore, the essences of the metals can be combined, but the bodies of the metals cannot be combined. To form, that is, they can be combined on a physical level for purposes of hardware, but not in terms of mystical understanding. So before, an, uh, before any uh, form of knowledge can be united to another form of knowledge, both of these elements must be subjected to and reduced to their principle. Therefore, we have to go behind what is known. We have to break through knowledge in the sense of tradition. We have to break through knowledge in the sense that it is a binding power. We, when we say, I know, and what we are really doing is quoting from a text from Harvard or, or uh, Oxford, this won't do it. None of the knowledge that comes from the outside, in its natural outside form, can be united with any other form of knowledge on the outside. Therefore, before knowledge can be united with another form, it must be reduced itself or elevated to the state of a soul principle. It must be transmuted in itself from body to soul. Souls can mingle, bodies cannot. Therefore, all knowledge, before it can mingle with other night knowledge, must lose the errors in itself. It must be re relieved of the traditional limitations which the mind has placed upon it. We must no longer defend schools of thought, because these thought schools can never be reconciled. But if thought can be res rescued from schools, it can mingle with other thoughts. The same is true in religion. We cannot take one religion and impose it upon another because the separatenesses are all artificial. We take two great religions. We study them. We discover that in substance and essence, their teaching is relatively identical. We realize that the Ten Commandments are everywhere in the world. And as long as we think of them as principles, we can understand and imply them. But the moment we t limit that pattern to a religion, and another religion dis disagrees with us, though believing the same, we then come into religious hostility and persecution. We cannot worship God separately and be at the same time one in our religious consciousness. When we, however, get over the sectarian fact and face into the divine reality, all religions can meet. We can all meet upon the level of certain principles, but never after these principles have been embodied in various creedal and sectarian patterns until they have become practically mummified in them. Die, have they died in the sectarianism, which destroyed their power to be one. So if we want to get one religion in this world, a religion in which all truth is available and for the end forever of the problems caused by religious differences, there'll be no more inquisitions, no more crusades, no more fighting even in family life over religious m memberships. If we really have religion, we're safe. If we have theology, we're in serious trouble. And it is the same with everything else. Languages. We need more languages, but we need to realize that someday we're going to have to find what the ancient Aya people found 10,000 years ago, that there is a root language. And when we understand and know that root language, we can all communicate with each other. It isn't necessary to take lessons in a dozen languages to become a great linguist. It is only necessary to find the common root of of communication. There is one, but we haven't found it yet. There always has been. In medicine, there is only one art, the art of healing. There are all schools of medicine. There are all opinions. Much of it developed by laboratory research. Much of this is useful. No one denies it. But nearly all of it is limited to fighting the problems of the body. We take sickness and try to cure it. 
if we had the common understanding of the alchemy of healing, we would not have to cure it because we would not cause it. It is const we are fighting constantly to get over our own mistakes. But if once somewhere along the line, this principle of unity can take over and we can find in oneness of character and conduct a, a great release. We get a shadow of this, of course, even now in the things that are happening. We are being warned against certain indulgences and certain mistakes. Medical science says if you don't take on uh, cocaine, you're not going to have to suffer from the consequences. Well, this is perfectly true. But there should be something else, deeper, that prevents the individual from even considering the use of cocaine. It is not a matter of curing against a whole public uh, mass of people who want to do as they please. The problem is that there is one right way, and that right way transmutes all the mistakes that are dependent upon that particular right way. So in politics and in all these problems, we have to realize that there is a divine government. There is a government of realities. There is a government which we have all been seeking for a long time. And to gain it, we have to realize that this government is the same thing exactly as that which we must impose upon ourselves. Our own bodies contain more living units than inhabit the earth at the present time by many, many times. Yet we have no great problems with them because they are occurring within a disciplined pattern. The same way we have to discipline society. There has to be a relationship between man and nature. What we should be striving for every moment is to find the ways by which all complications are resolved. This is the transmutation process. Selfishness must be transmuted. It is not destroyed. It is given a form of idealistic regeneration. Every fault that we have is a virtue misapplied. It is something that should be done differently. But we don't destroy energies. We simply give them an opportunity to express the best of themselves. So this alchemy probably is going to go on for a little while during the present uh, century and into the century that is yet to come. We are beginning now, and uh, while it's not easy, we are beginning to realize that we cannot do exactly as we please. But if we insist on trying to succeed at the expense of everyone else, we will all fail together. This is not the way it is done. It is not that we are here to get all we can. We are here to give all we can. We are not here to dogmatize. We are here to learn. And education is the problem of the gradual search for the sovereign reality. And this sovereign reality has always been a matter of the highest spiritual development. It is something in which here and there one will arise, born or cultivated, by who, by own, his own or her own inner values, becomes aware of the facts. And uh, maybe not yet has anyone been aware of all the facts. But we are gaining, step by step, the first big lesson. And that is that there are rules, the game of life, and these rules are not made by human beings. These rules are inherent in the life principle itself. We cannot misuse life without sorrow. We cannot take something that is intended for the common good and try to apply it only to ourselves so that we may have special profit. This will not work. So we watch around us. We see things that a lot of people feel very unhappy about. But we also realize gradually that our own fumbling is becoming unendurable. We are in trouble every minute. We are in trouble because we have gradually complicated our mistakes. When we were a small group of people living on a large planet, our mistakes sort of faded away. Everyone took his mistakes to the grave with him. Now, however, these mistakes are being circulated through one nation after another. All of a sudden, we are one vast family. 
We are in a one humanity in conflict and stress with parts of our own family. Everywhere the struggle for survival has been multiplied in its intensity and the survival idea has been lost. We are all struggling not for survival but for domination over others. So this keeps on going and all of a sudden it looks pretty easy, pretty bad. We can see now what we couldn't have seen 25 years ago and actually this is growth. We are now uh, bewildered, we are intimidated, we are at loss, we do not know what to do next, we do not know where to turn for instruction, but we are therefore in the condition of the prodigal son who has wasted his substance in riotous living and has now repented and is trying to find his way back to his father's house. And this is what we're all doing whether we realize it or not. We're all trying to find the way to correct the mistakes that exist. And the mistakes exist are scientifically controllable. If science would gradually try to find out exactly how the great sovereign energy works, why it works, and what universal life is attempting to do, if science would give this more thought, and could find out just even a little more about what the purpose of things is and get over the idea that man has been hopelessly isolated and must find out everything for himself and must build a world according to his own desires in a universe ruled by immutable law which can never be broken. Anything that attempts to break a law is broken by it. If science, then knowing its exactitudes and being able now to make ships that will go to the moon, headed for Mars almost immediately, if someone is, can bring this point home, that the one great answer that we must find is why we are here, what we are here for, and how we can work together to fulfill a purpose that we can never dominate, but we can venerate, recognize, and cooperate with. We can always realize there are not many ways of doing it right. We never have the freedom of choice that we think we have. For each individual, finally, there is only one possibility of choice, and that is to choose what is inevitable. This uh, understanding can also begin to work in our lives. We can get over a lot of the pressures of family, a lot of the inconsistencies and inharmonies of daily existence. If we try to the best of our ability to live according to the life within us, and this life says this is only one, and all others have it. When we speak of another, we are speaking of another self. We are speaking of ourselves. I remember the little story from Japan when uh, I was there, talked to a Japanese, and we saw two men bowing frantically to each other in the lobby. And the friend dismissed me, he says, you know, this man, that man over there is bowing, is a nice fellow. And this other man he's bowing to is a rogue. Why and why should a good man bow to a rogue? Well, he's the man, my friend said, there are two reasons. First, this man is a rogue, but behind that rogue is God, regardless of what he does. Because if it wasn't, God wasn't there, he'd drop dead in his tracks. Therefore, there is a divinity in him, and uh, this is respected even if his conduct is not. And he says, there's a second reason also. Bowing is good for the stomach. <laughs> So the least you get out of it is a little help. And with a little help like that, we can go a great way. And by gradually trying at least to bow to the truth as we confront it, and making every effort to overcome every dividing factor in our lives, and trying according to the best of our ability to recognize that with us always is a power that we should respect and venerate that this unseen guest is the source of ourselves. 
And we may not see it for a long time, but we know its presence. And the more we know about it, the more we respect it. And out of respect comes love, and out of love comes obedience. So if we all work it out the best we can, the universal transmutation will take place. Well, that's it, folks.